To turn the tables on his enemies, he devised a bizarre plan called Snow White. Its stated aim was to correct false reports about Scientology. It led to Scientology members infiltrating government departments. Hubbard even issued a reading list for learning the black arts of espionage. He believed that there was an international cabal that was in control of the attack on him around the world as well as the attacks on various countries. And so Snow White was written to find this cabal, find all the connections between all these enemy groups, to expose them, to destroy them. It was done through infiltration. In some cases it was done through burglary. It was just pure military intelligence. Having instigated Snow White, Hubbard rejoined his ship in the Canary Islands. There he had a serious motorbike accident. His mood dramatically worsened. This was his period, which I call the pouting, the crying, the, the mad period, where he would cry and throw things against the wall, the, the bulkheads, and pout and scream. But right toward the tail end of that, he created the RPF, the Rehabilitation Project Force. The RPF was yet another correctional regime. Its orders were fearsome. As ship's captain, it was Hannah Eltringham's job to implement them. I was absolutely horrified when I read them because they talked about the creation of this pretty much like a slave labor camp. Those weren't the words used, but that was the impression given, where the unwanted, those found wanting, seriously wanting, were, uh, were sent and they were to be kept in this with no rights, no freedoms, no privileges of any kind. Pretty much the basic rights they were allowed were a little bit of sleep each day, food leftovers, um, the harshest treatment. They were not allowed to speak to any of the crew. It was very, very, very bad that this was going on. But Hubbard's statement to us was that it's going to take a lot more ethics and a lot more punishment than anyone has, can easily face up to, to get this whole world back in shape. And at that point, I believe that statement. Human emo emotion and reaction is, uh, is the way humans were. And he didn't specially regard humans very highly. He liked the idea of the doll bodies that were in other civilizations. Doll bodies didn't have human emotions and reactions. They were, I guess, like Spock, you know, just very analytical. You just get the job done. No emotions there. Love is not a sentiment that's known or cared for. So, and that's, to me, the tragedy, because he put that, I feel, into the organization, and into the way of being in the organization. Hubbard even consigned his own son, Quentin, who was a senior auditor on the ship, to the RPF. Quentin really was a real sweet kid. He was a real nice guy and, and, and very soft-spoken. And it was very difficult for him being uh, Hubbard's son and, and being put on these, in this very high position, and I don't think he was that interested in it. He just wanted to be a pilot, and also the fact that he was gay, and that's a very tough thing in Scientology, to be gay, because uh, especially that kid. To be Hubbard's son and to be this top technical person and be gay, oh, that would be a horrible thing to be wrestling with and suppressing all the time. Quentin was sent to the RPF after he committed the sin of trying to commit suicide. Two years later, he succeeded. Hubbard saw it as a betrayal because everything was referenced around him. The world was doing everything to him. This technology that was supposed to work didn't even work on the senior person of all technology. You know, Hubbard and his son, you know, you no, know, he just saw that as an attack from his son. And that's, you know, the love was gone. He didn't, he was not a lot, he had lost love. In 1975, Hubbard decided it was time to come ashore. He sent scouts to look for a suitable land base. They settled on Clearwater in the rich state of Florida. He stated coming ashore would be profitable because we could get so many more people 
to the flag land base, as it was to be called for auditing and training. And he also wanted to concentrate on getting professionals to the land base because, of course, they had more accessible money. They had pension funds, they had children's education funds, and some of these he named um, that were accessible. Hubbard knew Scientology would be unwelcome, so he devised a top-secret battle plan. He called it Operation Goldmine. Using a cover name, the United Churches of Florida, Hubbard issued secret orders to take over the town. These orders, in effect, very clearly stated, move into this uh, area, find out who your friends are, develop them, find out who your enemies are, destroy them, and then move into every possible area uh, of community life, business, social, religious, education. The plan worked. Clearwater is a Scientology bastion. Scientology owns many prime sites. Big name Scientologists like Lisa Marie Presley have moved in. You could get all the big high rollers, you get the people with the dollars, and you can make a fortune. And I believe the income uh, for a week, this is like in 1970, 78. 79 was somewhere as a half a million a week. I mean, it was it, that, that's where the big bucks started to be made when you could do that. With the money rolling in, Hubbard moved to California, where he'd play his last great role. His ambition was to film sci-fi blockbusters based on his books, but he ended up making Scientology training films. The movie mogul, Cecil B. DeMille, you know, it was like he was. He tried to be bigger than life, but he just wasn't. So he would make these extravagant sets. They were ludicrous. They were not big productions. They were just silliness. They were an egomaniac. He tried to be flustery and big and powerful, but if you look, just stepped and observed, you could see that he had fear about everything. And finally the fear came down to dust particles. Little teeny dust particles. He had phobias about dust. He had phobias about uh, smells. He had phobias about sounds. So he would hear sounds that weren't there. And he would scream at the sound technician. And uh, he would see things that weren't there. And he would scream at the people who were fr framing the shot and he would smell smells that weren't there and he'd have people rinse his clothing some 13 or 15 or however many times. In 1977, while Hubbard was away making movies, the FBI caught up with the Snow White operation and raided Scientology headquarters in Los Angeles and Washington. Hubbard's wife, Mary Sue, and eight other Scientology executives were convicted and sentenced for conspiracy and stealing government documents. Hubbard disappeared, never to be seen publicly again. After living in a succession of hiding places, he ended up on this secluded ranch in the California hills. Secrecy has veiled his final years, but one man, Robert Vaughan Young, who was then a Scientology public relations officer, was later given a description of Hubbard by one of his guardians. This, and evidence from Hubbard's autopsy report, paint a sad picture. He had grown a beard, he had grown his long hair. The nails were long, very much in the, in the same problem as uh, they found out with Howard Hughes, unkempt nails. Um, uh, neighbors, uh, there was a neighbor that walked in on him one day and he had become very frightened and suddenly scurried out of the barn. He was frightened to meet people. He was, he was terrified of meeting any new people. Uh, he, was, he was disappearing down, down, down into this little strange world of his that he had created. And the, the irony of this is this is a man that was promulgating and telling the world that with my technology and ideas you can get bigger and bigger and bigger and yet he was shrinking down until finally he was hiding. On January the 24th, 1986, Ron Hubbard died. The Church of Scientology said he'd simply quit his body to continue his work elsewhere. 
him dying suddenly made him very mortal. And the last thing we could have is to have Hubbard be mortal. So a story had to be designed. And the story is that he went off to research the next level. And what's amazing is how the Scientologists bought this with, without any questioning. They, they bought it. Today, the L. Ron Hubbard image is carefully protected by the Church of Scientology. It says he is the greatest humanitarian in history. Hollywood has named a street after him, and millions of dollars roll into Scientology every year. It continues to preach that Hubbard's teachings are the best solution to the mental problems of the world. The personal tragedy is, one mind Scientology did not appear to help was that of its founder. Secret Lives next Wednesday at 9 profiles the holiday camp king Billy Butlin. Our film next tonight on 4 is Caddyshack.